Good morning. Uh, my name is Steve Tofel. I'm the president of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at Dartmouth. It's the full name. We don't often use it. Uh, I wanted to uh, say some thank yous again now that we have uh, made it to our final lecture on a, what was a very challenging series to prepare, challenging in that we didn't know that we would be here in person, uh, where we weren't sure, and so we had to make contingency plans. But it, we pulled it off. It came out well. Uh, the uh, virtual uh, feed has worked very well, and uh, I'd like to welcome you all here. I also want to thank um, Ann Hargraves and Roland Kutchel, who did this remarkably uh, difficult uh, production, and also the uh, chairs of the Summer Lecture Series Committee uh, from the past. Uh, the first was David Bisno, followed by Bruce McDonald, followed by Tom Blinkhorn, and then Pete Blyler and uh, John Ferries did it for several years, and then Ann and Roland took over. Uh, thank you all. It has been a great success and please enjoy. And now Ann Hargraves will take over. Good morning. As you've heard, I'm Ann Hargraves and this is Roland Kuchel. We are, as uh, Steve just said, uh, co-chairs of the summer lecture series. There are about 150 of us here in Spalding, and in about 250 more are remote. We welcome members of our sister programs who are joining us remotely. Granite State Ollie in Concord, New Hampshire, UMass in Boston, University of Georgia in Athens, Georgia. Just in case any of you are here for the first time, I'm going to remind you of the Q&A procedure. Those in Spalding were given an index card when you walked in. Please write your questions on the index card and give them to either Roland or me at the break or put them in the box. There's also, uh, for those of you joining us remotely, there's a chat window. If you'd like to give your name and where you're from, submit those questions there. We thank our underwriters who underwrite the whole series. Jack and Dorothy Byrne Foundation, Caldwell Law, Kendall at Hanover, The Village at White River Junction, Wells Fargo Advisors, and thank you to our sponsor this week, Tyler Sims and St. Savour CPAs. The comic book, you've heard me talk about the comic book, it's a great book. This is the last week you can pick it up at uh, the entry. Uh, it was produced by the Center for Cartoon Studies in White River Junction, and it's wonderfully done, and it'll cost you $5. At the break, Professor McCarty will sign his book, Polarization, What Everyone Needs to Know. The last in-person debrief discussion of the summer lecture series will take place at the conclusion of this morning's lecture and Q&A, and it will begin at 11.45. For those who have registered or who are interested in registering and attending today at the conclusion of this morning's program, look for an OSHA staff member just outside the auditorium. She will be holding a sign which says, meet here for debrief session and will lead participants to the classroom. There is no cost to these half hour stimulating discussions. And now Roland will introduce the speaker. Thank you very much, Anne. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Nolan McCarty, uh, Professor of Political Science at Princeton University and Director of the Data Intensive Social Science Initiative at that facility. Professor, uh, Professor uh, McCarty uh, was a tenured professor at political, of political science um, at Columbia University before coming to Princeton some time back. And he's a graduate of the University of Chicago and holds uh, graduate degrees from Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. Uh, he is a graduate, he is a author of and co-author of numerous uh, works, 
Uh, he is uh, particularly uh, uh, well known for his book uh, co-authored uh, uh, called Political Bubbles, Financial Crises and the Failure of American Democracy. Uh, the Political Polarized America, Dance of Political Ideology and Unequal Riches. And uh, Can America Govern Itself? Uh, edited, uh, published in 2019 and co-edited by with Francis Lee. Uh, and this work points out that our 2016 election uh, raised issues of deep ideological, cultural, racial, regional, regional, and economic divisions. But one aspect often uh, missed is that these fissures have been opening over several decades and are deeply rooted in the structure of American politics and society. It's my honor to welcome and introduce you to Professor Nolan McCarty. Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Roland and Anne. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Let me just say this is my first public lecture since before the pandemic, so hopefully the rust will come off relatively quickly, uh, but it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, let me say a little bit about the title of the talk to give you some context for where it's going. So actually, as Roland mentioned, Can uh, America Govern Itself is the name of a collaborative book project. But notably, it was begun in 2015. Uh, so while you know, uh, things over the past seven years have not been particularly good in terms of the governance of American society, uh, these were concerns that we had you know, well, well before that. So I want to give you some, some reasons to understand why we were raising these concerns uh, you know, in 2015 and to talk a little bit about uh, how they have gotten uh, worse over the past uh, seven years. Okay, uh, so, that's where, you know, so that's where I would like to go with this. Uh, so just to start out, you know, why were we concerned about this in 2015? Well, a large part of it had to do with the fact that over, I would say, about the last 40 years, we've witnessed a considerable decline in the confidence that the American people have in the capacity of our liberal democratic institutions uh, to solve problems in an efficient and equitable way. And so by liberal democratic institutions, I mean things like elections, legislatures, separation of powers, the structure uh, of our Constitution uh, with its checks and balances uh, and, and popular sovereignty. Uh, evidence of the decline that voters have in the confidence of our institutions to solve problems can be found in numerous uh, public opinion surveys, uh, and I think they're largely responsible for the rise of kind of populist uh, and nationalist rhetoric that we've seen over the, pa over the past decade. Uh, so, what, so what we did in 2015 was to think about causes. You know, why is it that there's such anxiety about the future of American democracy? Uh, and so much, based on much of my work, I proffered uh, one cause, and that's the deep polarization of our political system. Uh, we've witnessed over the past 40 years, I'll show you some data on this in a second, uh, a tremendous increase in the level of ideological and partisan animosity, a real hollowing out of the middle of the, middle of the road. Uh, and that's led to several problems in the performance of our uh, political system, which I think uh, you know, undergirds why, why Americans uh, have lost some, some confidence. So why, why is political polarization and this increased anxiety about American democracy uh, connected? So let me just you know, give you several reasons. Uh, first, there's a real issue that the cacophony of political debate turns off a lots of Americans. There's a lot of evidence on that, that, that you know, Americans are really turned off by the types of arguments and battles that they see on cable TV and on the internet and, and, social, and social media. 
Uh, second, the polarization of our system has really incentivized politicians and other elite political actors to exploit uh, divisions in order to, you know, maintain power, win elections, uh, and pursue partisan gain. And then finally, and what I'm really going to focus on is the fact that polarization itself, especially at the level of Congress, which is what I'll focus on, uh, presents really uh, significant challenges for good governance. And so people are actually anxious about the quality of governance because the quality of governance has, in fact, fallen during this period, this period of polarization. Um, so, you know, if you, if you don't believe me, we can uh, simply look at the headlines. You know, there are lots of issues uh, that are pressing in the United States, and uh, we don't really seem to ha have a strong, effective, efficient, equitable governmental response. So let me just remind you of a few. Inflation, although I think it was zero last, it was zero last month, but still uh, high. We had COVID, the COVID response. Climate change has been an issue on the agenda for a very long time uh, with uh, not a whole lot of effective government responses. Guns, economic and racial inequality, immigration and border security, and, and educational performance. So there's a lot of things, you know, problems that the American government could address. Uh, but have not uh, been very, very effective. Now, to be fair, uh, the recent Congress and the Biden administration, in fact, even, even during the Trump administration, you know, made some strides on some of these uh, issues. I mean, this past week, uh, or the Senate passage of uh, a bill that will uh, make big investments uh, in cleaner energy uh, as a success for climate change. Uh, but very few people would argue that, you know, Congress and our political system has provided, uh, you know, adequate, comprehensive solutions to any of these problems, even though they're they're quite they're quite big problems. So I'm going to argue uh, that polarization uh, is largely to blame uh, for the lack of uh, success on these on these issues. Uh, so why is it that polarization? Uh, has led to this uh, lack of governmental response or poor governance. Let me just kind of outline some of the reasons. Uh, first, uh, bicameralism, uh, the fact that we have two chambers of Congress, they're often in, uh, controlled by different parties, different factions of different parties, and other super majoritarian institutions in our government make forming winning coalitions very difficult, even the best of times. Uh, even if we go back to the, you know, the, the late 1960s and 1970s, where there was uh, early 1970s, where there's much more bipartisanship, it was still very, very hard to make coalitions that could pass important legislation. Uh, but polarization has made a situation where uh, there are no longer any bipartisan coalitions, and so the only time we get really significant changes is when one party's big enough to, to go it alone. Uh, and in our equally divided competitive political system, that's become increasingly, uh, increasingly rare. A second issue that emerges is that even within our parties, you know, the Democratic Republican Party, they're much farther apart from each other than they have been in any time in the last 40 years, yet they're both internally factualized. There's polarization within each of the parties. Uh, particularly within the Democratic Party, between a moderate wing and a progressive wing, uh, and some, uh, some factionalization within the Republican Party, although they seem to have converged uh, on, a, on a leader. Um, uh, a third reason is that as polarization increases, uh, legislators uh, lose their incentives to police uh, their own presidents. Uh, so we see uh, during the Trump administration, we see Republicans in Congress not conducting very much active oversight of uh, the administration. Uh, we don't see Democrats clamoring to do a lot of uh, oversight over the Biden administration. And then when the tables are turned, uh, we expect we will see excessive oversight uh, if the Republicans take over the Congress in the same way we've seen aggressive oversight of the Democratic Party. Uh, so oversight no, serves more partisan purposes in a polarized era than in governance issues. 
So all of these things have sort of combined uh, to, uh, uh, to lead to a situation in which we get poor, uh, poor legislative outcomes, if, if any at all. So let me just, uh, so that's the argument I want to make. Uh, let me just uh, provide some additional context for some of the claims that I'm going to make uh, by talking about some of the data. Um, this is a, a graph of polarization that I and my uh, collaborators have developed using roll call voting in Congress as a way of measuring uh, the levels of polarization. Uh, so this is a measure and it presents both uh, the measure for both the House and the Senate, the House in red and the Senate in the blue dotted line. And the best way to think about the statistical measure is that it uh, takes a set of roll calls and it looks at who votes with whom. So you're a conservative if you vote with conservatives most of the time, moderates some of the time, and liberals none of the time. You're a liberal if you vote with liberals most of the time, moderate some of the time, and conservatives none of the time. Uh, and then we use a procedure to basically sort all that out, somewhat like your Netflix uh, uh, recommendation algorithm, uh, if you will. So we're able for every legislator who served in Congress since 1787 to assign them a score in terms of left to right, liberal to conservative. We simply measure polarization as the difference between the two parties on this scale. Another way to think about the measure is it simply tells you uh, how infrequently members of different parties vote together. So if you want to think of it in the simple terms, it's that. So higher numbers are more polarized. So let me just, you know, here's the, here's, you know, the bulk of the data that I'll talk about today. So let me just highlight uh, some of the takeaways. Uh, from this figure. The first is that polarization has varied a lot throughout U.S. history. Uh, the plot goes back to uh, Reconstruction uh, when the Democratic-Republican Party uh, system established itself. Uh, and you can see that it's varied tremendously o over time. It was very high, unsurprisingly, during Reconstruction at the end of the Civil War. Uh, it fell uh, through the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, was low for a very long time, and began rising again uh, in, the 19, in the 1970s. Okay. So when I say there's a 40-year, I, I, I've been working on this a long time. I actually started working on this in uh, 1993. Uh, so I used to say it was a 30-year trend. I've now started saying it's a 40-year trend. I, pretty soon I'm going to have to update and start saying it's a 50-year it's a 50 -year trend. So I, I, will, I will say 40 years a lot because that's practice, but it's actually closer to 50 at this point. Okay. So much of what I'm going to talk about are the causes and consequences of the rise in polarization that's taken place uh, since, the 19, since the 1970s. A second takeaway uh, from this is that uh, basically it's either going up, staying the same, or going down. It doesn't really jump around a whole lot. It doesn't move particularly in correspondence with uh, events. Uh, so actually, if you took the labels off the bottom with the years, you might, you know, you might not be able to, uh, to figure out which year is which. So it's really a, a set of long-term phenomena. It really is not uh, a response to the election of Ronald Reagan or the unsuccessful nomination of Robert Bork, Clinton's impeachment, Obama's election, or, or Donald Trump's election. Uh, it's a widespread long-term uh, phenomena that may well have caused those things rather than been consequences of these things. Uh, a third takeaway point is that uh, the House and the Senate are basically the same. Uh, it's not, polarization in Congress is not uh, isolated into the House of Representatives. It's not, fo it's not a special province of the Senate. It's a phenomena that has affected, uh, affected both chambers. And that has consequences for what we think are the causes of polarization. Uh, and I'll talk, about, I'll, I'll talk about that in more detail in, in, in a few minutes. If we want to explain why polarization happened, we need explanations that can focus on the House and the Senate 
uh, as well as, as I'll show you in a second, state, le state, legisla state legislatures. Uh, let me add an additional point here, which will be prominent uh, in some of my you know, attempts at coming up with a recommendation. And that is that polarization over the past, again, 40 years, the period in which I'm talking about has been asymmetric. Uh, here, instead of showing you the difference between the parties, I'm telling you the level of conservatism uh, of the parties, so obviously the Republican Party is higher, and always higher, Democratic Party is lower. But the upward trend in the Republican Party uh, toward more conservatism is much more pronounced than any movement of the uh, Democratic Party to the left. Uh, and in fact, uh, almost all of the movement of the Democratic Party is due to uh, the increased racial and ethnic diversity of their caucus. Uh, additional African-American and Latino representatives uh, explains almost all of it. Uh, the Republican uh, uh, caucus conference is one in which almost every new cohort over the past 40 years has been more conservative uh, than the previous cohort. Uh, so there's been a kind of a lockstep movement uh, on the right, and it goes back 40 years. It's not something that happened uh, in 2016, and that's something I'd like to like to stress. Uh, I've also measured it in the states and state legislators, uh, legislatures, uh, essentially using the same procedure. Uh, I can only go back to the mid-1990s for that, uh, but we see upper trends uh, in the states, both in the lower chambers and their upper chambers. Uh, there is some regional uh, variation. Uh, you all in the Northeast uh, have the least polarized state legislators because uh, many of your Republicans are still uh, on the more moderate side. Uh, but in other areas of the country, uh, there have been rapid polarization, primarily driven by, again, uh, a movement of the Republican Party uh, to, the, to the right. Okay. So these are the, you know, from, from basically two or three pictures, here, here is the, what I think is sort of the big picture, you know, of what's going on with polarization. And so if we want to think about what causes polarization, we need, we need to have explanations that, that uh, correspond with all of, these, uh, all of these facts. So let me now talk a, a little bit about the causes of polarization, what we know about it. Actually, I'm going to skip to this. OK. So oftentimes when people, the starting point for discussions about, uh, discussions about uh, the causes of polarization uh, of, in Congress, people will say, well, Congress is polarized because the people, the people are polarized. And you know, it's, the vo it's the voters, and it's the things that influence the voters, and that feeds back that feeds back into uh, uh, polarization in Congress. Uh, it's actually not so clear. Uh, there's still quite a debate about whether voters are even polarized at all. Uh, there's a debate about whether uh, voters are polarized in the, to the extent to which more extreme viewpoints are more common among voters than they were uh, in previous times. Uh, more hardcore left-wing voters and more hardcore right-wing voters, or whether it's just simply the fact that our party system is more sorted, uh, such that progressive voters are now all in the Democratic Party and conservative voters are all in the Republican Party, and therefore it gives the appearance of a, polar, a polarized system. Uh, so it's actually one of the things that is true is it's just actually not clear from the evidence that the voters have polarized, at least on policy, very much at all. So probably uh, the voters are probably not the primary cause of polarization that we've seen over the past 40 years. Um, it is true that polarization is highest among the more politically engaged. Uh, so if you're, very, uh, if you're an activist, sets of activists tend to be much more polarized than, uh, than uh, people who are, less active, who are less active in politics. Uh, you know, the more active you are, the more polarized you are. Uh, 
Uh, this has led lots of people to say one of the solutions for polarization is to engage the people uh, in the middle who are less engaged and are therefore more moderate, less polarized, we could get them engaged, we would have a less polarized electorate. But much of the evidence shows that once you engage people and get them active, they become polarized too. So, uh, so some of the solutions that really focus on engaging moderate voters uh, uh, don't really seem to uh, hold up uh, in the evidence. A third factor about the polarization of the public is it uh, tends to lag uh, polarization of elites and elected officials. So I showed you that Congress began polarizing in the late 1970s. Uh, almost all the evidence suggests that voters themselves, if they've polarized at all, uh, that began uh, in the mid-1990s or early 1990s, about 15 years after. Uh, so in many ways, the extent to which voters have polarized at all, they seem to have polarized as a response to what they see among their leaders uh, and the activists within their party. Uh, they're not really the driving force. There's a lot of discussion uh, about the role of media, cable, and the internet in polarization. Much of that's focused on the ways in which those media uh, uh, polarize uh, the public. Uh, again, you know, most of those, uh, with exception of cable, cable uh, entered in the late 1970s, but much of this came much later, so it's probably not a good explanation for why Congress is polarized. I should say one thing, one aspect of public opinion which is consequential, which has really taken off in recent years, is something known as affective polarization. Uh, affective polarization uh, simply is the idea that voters on opposite sides of the spectrum increasingly dislike each other. Uh, and that is something that's really grown, and I think that probably is fed back more into recent political debates uh, than any other. So just, it's kind of interesting. One of the pieces of evidence for this is there are polls uh, that ask uh, individuals whether they would be happy if their child married a person from the opposite party. And there's been a dramatic increase in the number of people who say they'd be very unhappy uh, for an interpartisan, uh, with an interpartisan marriage. Uh, to the extent to which, you know, uh, unhappiness about interpartisan marriage is much, much higher now than unhappiness about interracial or interreligious marriage or anything. So, so in terms of intermarriage, uh, partisanship is actually the, the highest uh, social identity. So that is a real, that is a real, con that is a real consequence. But again, it tends to be really concentrated in, in uh, very, very extreme voters on both sides. Okay, so the public has played some role in kind of reinforcing uh, the polarization, but is probably not uh, the big driving force. So let me talk about another area in which uh, people have looked at the question of, uh, you know, why our political leaders have become so polarized. Probably the most common explanation that people have proffered is that it's due to gerrymandering of congressional districts. So the idea is that districts are manipulated in particular ways so that you know, only uh, uh, extreme Republicans can win because the districts have been drawn to, uh, to, with only Republicans. Only extreme Democrats can win because the districts have been drawn without competition so that only Democrats can win. Uh, actually, the evidence for that idea is actually uh, not very strong. Uh, it, it actually is ruled out by the first figure I showed you because, of course, the Senate has never been gerrymandered, uh, and the Senate is just, uh, you know, is just as polarized as the House. Uh, the legislators from states with one district are just as extreme as, on average, as uh, legislators from states that have been, uh, ger have been gerrymandered. So there's almost no evidence that gerrymandering uh, is particularly consequential. The second culprit that people uh, tend to focus on are partisan primaries. The fact that many states require that only Republicans vote in Republican primaries and only Democrats vote in Democratic primaries. And so the argument is that if we opened up the primaries, allowed crossover voting, or adopted primary systems such as the one in California, 
we could reduce polarization because more moderate candidates uh, could win. Uh, there's actually, uh, here, there's actually not very much evidence either. Uh, states with open primary systems that allow Democrats to vote in Republican primaries and vice versa are just as polarized as states that don't, that don't, allow, that, don't allow that. Uh, and the, the top two primary system in California has done nothing to reduce the polarization of their, of their delegation or their state legislatures. A third factor, uh, again, this one is important, but in kind of uh, counterintuitive ways, is the campaign finance system. So a lot of focus on the uh, you know, potentially corrupting effects of Citizens United and corporate campaign contributions and uh, you know, the, the, the outsized role of interest groups. Um, it actually turns out when you look close at the data, it's the big corporations and big uh, donors that actually give to both sides. Uh, they tend to give more money to moderates, uh, and they're not giving money to extremists. Turns out to be small donors uh, through the internet who are giving uh, to extreme candidates uh, in increasingly large levels. Uh, so the, the polarizing effect of our campaign finance system uh, is primarily one which is driven by small donors uh, rather than the, the large donors. It's not to say, we, so when we think about reforms, it's not that we want to turn PACs and interest groups loose to camp the system and cut off individuals because that has its own repercussions. Uh, but uh, we, we have to understand that, you know, reforming uh, the campaign contribution system focused on, in, uh, on larger interest groups is probably not going to do very much for polarization. The fourth thing, and I'm going to actually spend, you know, in terms of, you know, offering my uh, uh, suggestions, I'm going to focus a lot on this question, and that is uh, the fact that we have something called a first-past-the-post election system for most of our, our seats. So as you, as you all know, uh, when you, typically when you go to the polls and you vote for a legislator or an executive, you know, you get one vote, uh, and then there's going to be one winner, and it's going to be the person who receives the most votes in that, di in that, di in that district. So that's known as first past the post. Uh, other countries have very different systems. I'll talk a little bit about uh, in a few minutes, uh, which you know, provide you know, uh, different opportunities for uh, other types of parties to win. So the argument about first past the post election systems is, as I will explain, they tend to focus on creating two-party systems, stronger two-party systems, you know, and uh, in a situation of polarization, it doesn't provide voters with much uh, in the way of a choice, uh, and that may, be, that may be a way out. Let me just present some data, mostly it, uh, because it, uh, not that it really related so much to polarization, but I, I think this is something worth, worth noting on the campaign finance side. So as I said, you know, part of the research on campaign finance uh, has shown that small donors uh, tend to be what's, polar what's polarizing the system, but it doesn't mean that small donors are, con are dominating uh, the campaign finance system. Larger donors are, are really uh, uh, out outsized in terms of our system. So what this graph shows is it shows the percentage of campaign contributions coming for either from the top 400 donors, top 400 richest people, or the top 0.01% uh, richest people, which is a much smaller set, or a much larger set than 400. Uh, and you can see that you know, in the 1980s, uh, these very wealthy groups gave about 12% of all contributions. Now they give about 40%. So, there, so I don't want to dismiss campaign finance as irrelevant because it is real relevant for political equality. It's just not as relevant for, uh, uh, for polarization. Uh, I should also mention one other area in which uh, th there's some pretty good evidence uh, of, a, of a cause of polarization, uh, and that is the long-term correlation uh, in the trends between economic inequality and polarization. And that's the subject of one of my earlier books. 
The only thing I will note here is the, is the idea that, you know, income inequality measures such as the top share, the percentage of income going to the top earners, or a Gini index, which is a measure of how unequal the income distribution is, and our polarization measure tend to track each other very closely. Inequality tended to be high at the beginning of the, 19th, uh, the 20th century, fell uh, dramatically over the course of the 20th century, and began rising in the late 1970s, just as polarization. Uh, so there are lots of reasons why, uh, you know, there's reason, reason to believe that, you know, economic inequality has created some of the political divisions uh, that we've seen, but also that uh, the political dysfunction associated with uh, uh, political inequality uh, has led to policies which have allowed income inequality to grow much more in the U.S. Uh, than it has in other, in other countries. So that's basically, so I basically covered, you know, in 20 minutes or so, uh, kind of the long-term view, you know, why we were concerned about these problems, you know, uh, by 2015. So now I want to transition a little bit to, you know, the recent years, uh, how things have changed, how they've stayed the same, uh, and briefly talk about, you know, some ideas for getting out of the problem. So let me just start with, uh, so I'll talk about the Trump presidency and beyond. Um, so the first thing that I think is important to remember about the Trump presidency with respect to polarization is that uh, uh, President Trump was quite ideologically heterodox. He did not come to office or didn't run for office with a conventional set of Republican views. Uh, if you think of the, the Romney-Ryan platform of 2012 as kind of the conventional uh, Republican orthodoxy. Uh, the President Trump did not share many of those views. He had very different policy positions on entitlements. He actually wanted to increase uh, Social Security uh, spending. He wanted to take reform, reforms of Social Security and Medicare uh, off the table. Uh, he thought they were losers uh, for the Republican Party. Uh, he had a very different foreign policy. You know, conventional Romney-Ryan Republicanism was very internationalist. Uh, he was very isolationist, you know, America first. Uh, and his views on immigration, while they were shared with, uh, you know, some in his party, you know, the dominant strain of his party was a pro-business immigration pro-immigration uh, for business reasons strain, uh, and so he was very much at, at odds. So in some sense, he presented an opportunity to kind of break the polarization, at least on policy grounds, by adopting a set of policies that were more popular uh, among some Democratic constituencies than among Republican constituencies. And I just note the partisan promiscuity in that, you know, uh, you know, a leader who's now become to d define the modern Republican Party was not a Republican uh, 12 years ago. Uh, he was either registered as an independent, uh, a Democrat, or a member of the New York Reform Party. Uh, if you look at the things that happened policy-wise during the Trump administration, though, uh, most of it was consistent with, uh, you know, what you might call Romney-Ryan Republicanism. Uh, I like to joke that it's basically the same policies you would have gotten out of a Jeb Rubio uh, administration. That's my uh, shorthand for conventional mainstream Republican as of, as, of, as of 2015, this kind of Frankenstein combination of uh, Jeb, uh, Jeb Bush and Marco Rubio. Uh, if you think about, you know, the main, the main big piece of legislation that passed was a tax reform bill, tax cut bill, reduction of the corporate tax. No reason to think that that would not have happened had a different type of Republican uh, been elected. You could argue that his immigration policies had a harsher, uh, more aggressive uh, tone to them than a Jeb Rubio uh, administration, but, you know, those were not, those were mostly administrative uh, enforcement decisions, not long-standing policy uh, goals. Uh, but of course, his presidency no, undoubtedly resulted in considerable partisan acrimony, both in the public uh, and in Congress, a divisiveness. 
you know, really contributed to this uh, affective polarization, uh, which I mentioned, which I mentioned, which I mentioned earlier, uh, and uh, really resulted in you know the deepening, if not hardening, of the divides uh, that I have shown you have been going on uh, for 40 years. Um, but arguably, even though he was able to basically solidify control uh, of his party, he was not really able to use that to make policy gains. Is notoriously unsuccessful in uh, his attempt to repeal the Affordable Care Act, uh, AKA Obamacare, because he couldn't get all of the Republican votes. But he was certainly able to, uh, to solidify you know, Republican support to sort of protect him from uh, impeachment and other, and other political challenges. And of course, it would be hard to talk about polarization in the current environment and, and what we need to do going forward without talking about January 6th and you know, election denial or stop the steal or, or skepticism about the outcome of the 2020 elections. Um, Although Republicans have pushed for measures like voter ID and seeking relief uh, from preclearance of the Voting Rights Act and other kind of electoral reforms, which uh, it might well have benefited from, uh, the extent of the January 6 efforts were clearly a qualitative upgrade to their efforts uh, to curtail longstanding democratic practices. Um, it wasn't simply just the use of the courts to try to you know, intervene and stop the elections, but the attempts to have uh, state, legislature, state legislatures decide uh, electoral votes, uh, and then the, uh, obviously the you know, attempt for intimidation and, and violence in order uh, to get that to happen uh, is just a, a major upgrade of any type of election reform efforts that Republicans have been trying uh, to do. Uh, it's important to note uh, that it's, uh, it's an on, going to be an ongoing effort. Uh, the Supreme Court this year will uh, hear a case related to something called uh, the Independent Legislature's Doctrine, which is the idea that state legislatures are uh, sovereign in all issues related to elections, which would give state legislatures the right to, if they chose to do so, uh, to choose uh, electors themselves, override independent uh, redistricting commissions, and so forth. So there's, so even beyond January 6th, there's sort of an organized effort uh, to kind of restore the supremacy of state, the state legislatures uh, in electoral processes uh, at a time in which you know, Republicans control many of the state legislatures uh, in pivotal states. Uh, due to the advantages that they have gotten through the redistricting, the di redistricting process, so that's a, a qualitative upgrade uh, in the uh, in the level of uh, concern. So we see, uh, you know, as a result of this, I mean, again, these trends aren't completely new, but they've really uh, exacerbated a really strong erosion of democratic norms uh, that have sort of accompanied this kind of anxieties about the capacity of our traditional system to solve problems and political polarization. The first, uh, the first evidence of this erosion of norms is what, I, what I'll call, what a lot of people call constitutional hardball. You know, the idea that, you know, uh, elected officials, leaders should push the constitutional to its breaking point, if not go past that breaking, breaking point. So even beyond the kind of election stuff, you can find many, uh, many evidences of Trump pushing executive power extremely hard. Um, Congress never, for example, Congress never appropriated money for his border wall, but he decided unilaterally to take the money out of the military construction budget uh, and repurpose it there in ways that were, you know, uh, marginally, uh, marginally legal. Uh, he abused the appointments and vacancy clauses to put uh, to put uh, loyalists into off into office uh, into offices without Senate confirmation. Uh, so these are just some examples of ways in which uh, you know the system was pushed very hard. And of course, there's the failure uh, you know to accept election outcomes. 
Obviously, you can find evidence of cases where Democrats in the past have called into question the legitimacy of election outcomes, but they've never quite pushed it as hard as the current Republican Party, uh, and they are not pushing uh, this very kind of extreme notion of uh, state legislative supremacy over elections, which can over, in which a, a state legislature can overturn election outcomes. Uh, we've seen, uh, you know, uh, some evidence on both sides, although I won't say both sides, I think it's really concentrated within Republican elites and electorate, some tolerance, if not advocacy, uh, advocacy of, of, of violence. And so throughout all this, we, we find ourselves in a very different place in 2015, even though some of the origins of the current problems were already, were already there. So this is really has transformed, uh, you know, in the past seven years, really transformed the party system. You know, before polarization was mostly uh, a phenomenon of increased disagreements about two relatively pro-democratic, pro-democracy parties. Obviously, as I said, Republicans have fought for rules with electoral advantage. Democrats fight for rules to give them electoral advantage, but all this was within the, the realm of accepted democratic uh, disputes. Uh, but now we have a, a major party that has become uh, a little bit more enamored with anti-democratic and illiberal uh, ideals. Uh, mostly illiberal ideas, not so much democracy. You know, they're very much uh, uh, enamored with, uh, there's a lot of popularity for Viktor Orban, the prime minister of Hungary, who's used elections and winning elections to change their constitution to, to make it uh, much less political competition. I, I think that's probably the goal. So if we think about the future of liberal democracy uh, in the US, there really seems to be three paths. We could have a reorientation of the GOP, a, re a repudiation of some of their recent, uh, some of their recent efforts. Uh, this seems unlikely. Uh, there is, you know, at least until uh, his house was raided a few days ago, there seemed to be some softening of support for Donald Trump uh, when you look at uh, public opinion polls. But it's not clear that there's a softening uh, for Trump, Trumpism in many of the, the approaches that he would take. So for example, Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida, uh, you know, the most prominent ch possible challenger to Donald Trump in 2024, has shown a great willingness to play constitutional hardball in Florida, uh, you know, including uh, attacking Disney and other companies who criticize his policies, uh, trying to prohibit uh, professors at the University of Florida for testifying in election law cases, uh, and a whole variety of other uh, examples. Uh, and we still see strong voter support for uh, the idea that the 2020 election was illegitimate. The second way forward seems to be for Democrats to win enough seats to create a supermajority large enough to fully control the, gov to control the government. Uh, I think this is also not likely. We still remain in a very deeply divided country. Uh, it would require the Democrats to moderate some policy demands to create a larger tent uh, to attract disaffected Republican voters who don't like the illiberal parts of their party uh, but like, the like some of the policies. Uh, a recent episode in a congressional election in Michigan suggests uh, that this is also unlikely. The Democratic Party actually spent money on behalf of a uh, election-denying pro-Trumpist candidate in order to defeat one of the 10 members of Cong Republican members of Congress who voted for uh, Donald Trump's second impeachment. Uh, so it's very clear that the Democratic Party uh, doesn't have uh, strong incentives uh, to build a tent large enough uh, to become, uh, to solve the problems related to democracy. Uh, so it, it suggests that some of the Democratic Party aren't taking the threats to democracy seriously enough to subordinate some of their other, to subordinate their other goals. So the remaining choice seems to be something like a third party uh, for uh, pro-democracy, center-right voters. Uh, 
those who uh, you know, support democratic norms and practices, but not uh, the policy positions of the, Dem of the Democratic Party. Uh, this is often uh, business. You know, one of my deepest concerns is that, you know, is that business will align itself with a deeply anti-democratic, illiberal, right-wing party, uh, and that, that is just a, a recipe for, you know, uh, ex big problems. Uh, business, you know, they, they support democratic initiatives at times, but it's hard to imagine a long-term alliance between business and the Democratic Party that would prevent that. So I, I think uh, this will get me in trouble with my professional colleagues in political science because we often laugh about uh, third parties, but I think that may be the only uh, real solution. So let me just quickly, I only have a few minutes, but let me just talk about where the, where the, problem, where the problem lies. So if you think about electoral systems, uh, uh, the reason, uh, I should, yeah, let me just back, I lost my place here. I, some of the rest is coming back, my apologies. Um, so, you know, one of the reasons why, you know, we haven't seen much successful third parties is that the United States has not been very hospitable to third parties. If you look at data, there are very few independents or third parties holding any office at any level uh, in the U.S. government. Uh, it's been this way for over 100 years. And it's largely related to the properties of our electoral system. Uh, it's this first-past-the-post system or plurality system, which I mentioned before. We have single-member districts. The candidate with the, who wins the most votes wins the election. Uh, some, in some places, we have uh, uh, an innovation of that uh, called a majority system, where the winning candidate must receive a majority of the votes. This often requires two rounds of voting, such as in, you know, you might recall the Georgia Senate runoff, uh, where it took two rounds uh, to, uh, to elect the winner. Uh, and there have been efforts, such as in New York City, I won't go into this, uh, to do this in one step through something called ranked choice voting and, and uh, uh, an, instant, an instant runoff. Um, but the real issue has been something that political scientists have called Duverger's law, which I'm going to argue isn't much of a law, but it's the idea that these plurality elections tend to lead to two uh, major parties, two and only two major parties. And the reason is, is that voters casting ballots for a third party might perceive their votes as wasted. Uh, they won't determine the winner. You can only determine the winner if you determine, you know, who's in first place versus second place. Casting a ballot that would affect second place versus third place won't matter very much. On the other hand, if we had a proportional system, like uh, much of continental Europe, where parties get seats related to the portion of their votes, then it makes sense to vote for third, fourth, fifth parties because your support will help translate into their share of votes and therefore uh, lead to their share uh, of seats. Okay. So this is the idea why you know, our electoral system is very inhospitable uh, to, 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 third, to third parties. So there have been a lot of suggested reforms uh, to deal uh, with this problem, uh, getting, taking on new uh, reforms. So one of them I mentioned before was ranked choice voting. Uh, ranked choice voting is the idea that instead of voting for one candidate, you go in and you rank all the candidates. Uh, and then there's an algorithm to eliminate candidates uh, sequentially uh, until you reach one in which uh, a candidate has majority has majority support. So this has been adopted in Maine. Uh, it's been adopted in New York City. But the problem is it doesn't solve the problem of single member districts. Uh, it's still the case that you know, voters are very incentivized to vote for one of the two, to two major parties. A more promising uh, avenue is to adopt multi-member districts. This is actually something that states could do for their congressional delegations uh, if Congress allowed it, it's by statute that Congress does not allow uh, the state of New York to have multi-member congressional districts. Uh, 
many states have multi-member uh, state legislative districts. They seem to work quite well. So Congress could adopt multi-member districts. That would give a little bit more latitude for third parties to emerge because, you know, uh, voters could vote for third parties in the hopes that they would get one of the, one of the seats that are allocated to that district. Uh, a third proposal is to have proportional representation like we have in, like we have in Europe, uh, which would allocate seats uh, based on vote shares, which again would create some leverage for, uh, for third parties. And then finally, and, and I think probably the most likely uh, easiest reform is something called allowing fusion, which allows third parties to nominate major party candidates uh, in order to uh, g attract votes for that party, which will give them future ballot access. But also, as it has in New York, it allows a party, smaller parties to have some leverage over major party nominees. So the Working Families Party in New York is a progressive party. Uh, Democratic candidates will often uh, compete to get the uh, uh, Working Party endorsement, uh, and that gives th that third party some leverage. And you could see that in some other some other states. That said, even though I think that there's uh, room for reform, uh, it's actually not the case that Duverger's law is destiny, and that really should not stop a, a legitimate third party uh, movement. Uh, this is just a measure of the number of parties. Uh, it's got a little bit of a complicated measure because it weights parties by their size. Uh, and so this shows the range of the number of parties in uh, electoral s in countries throughout the world based on whether they're first past the post, like the U.S. The U.S. says exactly two, or non-first past the post, proportional. Uh, you can see that while the U.S. has only two, most of the countries that have our electoral system have many, have many more. You know, two and a half, meaning they have a, a, a significant third party, like the U.K. So these are not weird countries. They're like the UK, and Canada, uh, and, and, uh, and India. You know, big major consolidated democracies have our electoral system and have more parties. So the question is how, how we're going to get there. My concern is that the nascent third party movements that we are seeing uh, are kind of destined to fail. And I think they're destined to fail for two reasons. One is they tend to be uh, excessively focused on uh, winning the presidency. That's something that's going to be impossible for a third party uh, for a third party to do, or even to win enough electoral votes to influence the presidency. They need to focus on local and state elections first. The second thing is they don't often really stand for very much. Uh, so, so the forward party was a new third party movement which was announced uh, last week. Uh, its uh, policy platform is simply electoral reform. This is the, if you go to their platform page, this is the figure. It's ranked choice voting, nonpartisan primaries, and independent redistricting commissions. I already told you I don't think any of those things will have much to do with polarization, and I can't see why many voters would be attracted simply to, uh, to an abstract platform of electoral reform. And then the other part of their platform is really just to be nice to one another, and I, I think that's really nice. You know, it's kind of, these are good rules for, you know, a, a kindergarten classroom, but not great rules for a political party that wants to win elections and gain, and gain power. Uh, so I think a third party is possible. I think there are things that uh, we can support and uh, that would help make that, that happen. But I, I think it would be great if uh, people took more seriously you know, the idea that we should have third parties. They, they can't you know, just be blanket parties. They actually have to stand for something. Perhaps they could take this center-right pro-democracy position that I've argued is important, uh, and that would go a long way in sort of helping the polarization, if not, you know, solving some of the governmental problems, uh, you know, that I've uh, uh, outlined. So, so let me stop there, and uh, you know, I will look forward to your questions after the break. <laughs>
So welcome back. Please be seated. We've received a number of interesting questions today that we will raise with uh, Professor McCarty. The first has to do with campaign financing. You did not mention the millions of dollars spent on our elections and the failure to pass effective limits on campaign contributions. My mother was a founding member of Common Cause, and those attempts to get big Murray out, money out of politics have failed. Uh, sure. Um, that, that is true. One of the reasons I didn't mention campaign finance as one of the festering unresolved issues is that uh, the real issue lies at the Supreme Court rather than in Congress. Uh, recent Supreme Court decisions, ideological trends on the Supreme Court have led to a much more permissive environment for campaign finance uh, than we've seen before. Uh, so many of the uh, things that one might think of doing to kind of rein in various excesses of campaign finance uh, have either been ruled unconstitutional by the Supreme Court or would almost certainly be ruled unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. The um, Supreme Court has essentially decided that campaign contributions uh, are a form of speech. Uh, they can be restricted in terms of uh, uh, size and so forth. Uh, and campaign expenditures uh, cannot be uh, restricted because they're uh, even more even more protected. Um, so many of the ideas on the reform agenda with respect to campaign finance are just not uh, in the cards, but not because of polarization directly, but because of you know trends on the Supreme Court, which have uh, led to a much more uh, permissive environment. Just just as an example, I'm on a uh, panel uh, preparing a study with a group of uh, other political scientists and law professors, and we're focused on what can be done with respect to campaign finance uh, to rein in kind of political extremism. About the only thing that we can find that musters, uh, satisfies constitutional muster is greater transparency rules, such that so that donors have to disclose more about their identities. Uh, the other things are just not going to pass legal scrutiny under the current Supreme Court. Thank you. This is on state election reform. What difference, if any, between red state reform and blue state reform movements? Uh, on, on elections? On state election reform. Uh, on state election reform. So there's been a major partisan divide uh, in terms of thinking about how to run, run elections. Um, essentially, the, the Democratic position has been one that uh, calls for more uh, increased convenience in voting, you know, making voting easier, uh, same-day reg making registration easier, same-day registration. Uh, looser restrictions on voter on voter uh, voter identification, uh, as well, you know, and then in the context of absentee voting, you know, the use of mail, of drop boxes, uh, allowing parties to collect ballots uh, to disseminate. So that's a kind of a democratic position. The Republican position has been almost the opposite uh, of, of those things. Uh, a real focus on you know what they call ballot sec security. So tighter restrictions on voter ID, uh, not making it necessarily that much easier uh, to vote, uh, restricting the use of drop boxes and ballot collection, harvesting by interest groups and parties, et, et cetera. So those are the kind of tr the two traditional uh, differences between what's going on in red states and blue states on elections. Uh, the big change, the one that I uh, mentioned during my talk, was this movement toward uh, state legislative uh, sovereignty over elections. So there have been uh, several states pass laws, red states pass laws, which uh, give state legislatures more authority to uh, intervene in elections, more uh, direct uh, oversight of state election officials, uh, et cetera. And so that's something that's going on in, in red states, but not, but, but not blue states. Thank you. 
Here's a question from Dave from Norwich. Our first speaker told us that uh, polar in this first speaker in this series told us that polarization started in the electorate and was only followed by the politicians. You seem to say the opposite. How do we know which is correct? Um, I, I, I showed you my, I showed you my data. Uh, you know, the, mostly, you know, the, the appearance of legislative polarization uh, started in, you know, the, the late 1970s. Um, much of the data on public opinion and polarization of public opinion, the extent to which they find polarization, they can only really date it from the 1990s. So, so that's the, you know, the headline effect. Um, I think the fact that many of the electoral reforms that I talked about don't seem to have much of an impact suggests that it's not really, politician not really driven by the way that voters participate in the process or not, uh, behind the, that's behind the process. So primary election, the way we do primary elections would play a bigger role if, you know, the public was a more important part of the process, but I think, uh, any time we see electoral reform, uh, its effects are sort of undone by partisan activists who are more polarized than the public. Uh, so I think there's a very strong direct and circumstantial case uh, that polarization started at the top uh, and seeped down. But it is true, and I will concede that, you know, things might have gotten out of control such that the polarization of the public, especially in terms of affective polarization and just partisan animosity, may be feeding back in to the polarization of uh, our leaders and elected officials in, in, in unfortunate ways. Thank you. This, uh, I'm, I have um, two questions uh, related to each other, and I think I'm going to ask you to uh, respond to both. I'll read the first. Citizens choosing their government leaders through the voting process is a positive feature of democracy. But this also causes our leaders to make decisions that give them votes and not necessarily make the decisions that are in the best for our country and people as a whole. And the second from the listener at the Granite State Ollie, which we welcome very much in terms of their attendance. Uh, can polarization be explained by a decision of one part to focus exclusively on winning and ignoring dealing with the real issues facing the country? So uh, the first question is really probably the oldest question in democratic political theory, uh, which is that, you know, what is the role of the representative uh, and the official? Uh, so going back to uh, Edmund Burke and a famous speech, uh, we tend to think of there being two types of representatives. They're sort of delegates, uh, people that we send to do things directly on our benefit. We tell them what to do and we control them. And then they're trustees, people that we entrust to make uh, the best decisions in our longer term interests uh, without consultation. So, you know, think of a, the, the word trustee, you know, it implies something like a, you know, a minor is uh, under the control of a trustee. The minor doesn't tell the, tr the you know, the you know, under 18 minor doesn't tell the trustee what to do, but the trustee is supposed to do what's in the best interest. So the trick has always been to try to push toward more trusteeship, to, uh, to basically empower leaders to make longer term decisions on the basis of our uh, self-interest. Um, but, you know, it's hard to hold such people accountable in, in the end, you know, that you, you have to have elections that, you know, let people register whether they're satisfied or dissatisfied. And so getting that tension correct um, is a very, you know, is a very difficult, very difficult problem. I actually think in our current period of polarization, because I think it's really driven by elites and not voters, is it's not really uh, that politicians are catering too much to voters. They may be catering too much to activists uh, and other politically engaged people. But uh, I, I think there's very little evidence that, you know, the polarization we've seen is really being driven by, you know, excessive uh, deference to regular, everyday, ordinary voters. 
you know, one example, one example of one example of this is that you know, oftentimes we'll see uh, a congressional district go from uh, having a Republican member to a Democratic member. The voters will be the same, but the behavior of the Republican and the Democrat will be radically will be radically different. Uh, it really is the fact that. You know, Democrat and Republican representatives are pursuing the agendas of their coalition of their coalitions uh, in Congress uh, and in the broader environment, uh, rather than those of their their, their constituents. So I, I don't blame you know regular everyday voters for polarization, and I don't think it's that politicians are catering uh, too much to them. In fact, you know there's some evidence to suggest that there there's an accountability failure and that politicians aren't catering to their voters enough. Uh, I'm sorry, could you remind me with this, the second question? Uh, it is similar. Um, can polarization be explained by the decisions on the part of one part to focus exclusively on winning and, de and ignoring dealing with the real issues facing the country? So I believe you, you've yeah. addressed that, but please. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. I, I, I think that I, I think it's covered. I don't, I don't think I don't think it's I don't think that's a, a good. Uh, explanation. I think the the voters care. I mean, the politicians, the polarized politicians, they care about policy issues. They just disagree about how to approach them, and they're unwilling to compromise. That's the ba that's the basic source. Uh, this is a question about perhaps the need to mention the role of Newt Gingrich in extreme polarization um, in our country's political life, or. Um, that's a great. That's a great question. There is some uh, evidence, and some people have focused on uh, a transition that took place within the Republican Party uh, in the late '80s and early '90s, uh, starting with the kind of emergence of Newt Gingrich and some of his fellow travelers, who then uh, basically took over control of the Republican Party in the House of Representatives famously put together a contract with America and won a majority in 1994. So, so Newt Gingrich was um, uh, you know, an important player uh, in this process. Um, the trends predate his emergence. Uh, they sort of have continued beyond his uh, demise. Uh, they're not just in the House of Representatives where he served, but they're in the Senate, the state legislators, et cetera. So I, I think he's an important player uh, in the emergence of polarization, probably an important player in some of the tactical things. Uh, one could argue that this trend toward constitutional hardball, you know, pushing the rules uh, to limits, uh, kind of a, an aggressiveness uh, in public life uh, are associated with his, his emergence. So he's an important factor in the story. Uh, but I think you know many many of the trends we've seen uh, would have, would have taken place uh, even if he had uh, not won his election uh, in 1978. Yeah. A question of a question on Twitter's impact on the media focus. The running top ten items trending on Twitter are often quote titillating and politically polarizing. Is this analysis that finds a correlation of Twitter's titillating political realization and polarized media reporting accurate? So there is a very active debate about the role of social media in, in polarization. Uh, anybody who spends any time on social media will recognize that the activity that goes on there, Twitter, Facebook, uh, is very is very polarized. The, the the networks of followers are very polarized, they're distinct from one another. The sources of information and news are quite are quite are quite distinct. So there's a it's obviously a contributing factor. There are a few reasons why uh, Twitter in particular is probably not a big factor. W one is that the strata of people who are politically engaged on Twitter is actually fairly small. Uh, it's a lot of journalists, a lot of academics, a lot of very politically engaged people for which we would expect them to be fairly polarized anyway, even if there wasn't Twitter. So one, one, part, one reason Twitter seems so polarized is it's very attractive to people who are, care about politics and policy or politically engaged and are polarized, and so they're, they're attracted. Uh, whether 
Twitter contributes to that is kind of an open is a kind of an open research question. Um, Facebook is a little bit more of a concern because uh, its user base is not as political in nature. It's millions and millions of people who are engaged and who may or may not get biased news sources, may or may not be open to kind of you know, manipulative advertising by candidates through, through Facebook. So I, Facebook is more of a concern, I would say, uh, than Twitter because it has the impact to reach, more, to reach more people. And honestly, we know less about Facebook because Facebook is, tends to be very secretive about their algorithms and their policies uh, and attempts to get Facebook to open up. Uh, their data uh, for academic scrutiny have kind of fallen, have kind of fallen short. Uh, Twitter's data, you know, anybody can go download a gazillion terabytes of it at any time and figure out what's going on in Twitter. So we know a lot about Twitter, but there's just not that many Twitter users uh, compared to Facebook where we don't know very much. Yeah. Alan from uh, Osher at Dartmouth. Um, does the current Trump GOP, in quotation marks, which has an authoritarian anti-democracy element, present very different problems uh, and threat than the polarization of the late 1800s? Um, so that's, uh, so I, I think the analogy, I, the analogy is interesting, but um, I, would, I would say that uh, a neglected part of the analogy is that there was kind of a, an authoritarian, there was kind of an authoritarian element that was very important within the Democratic Party in the late 1800s because if you recall from history, uh, Jim Crow didn't happen, laws were not implemented immediately uh, following the Civil War. There was a period of kind of uh, multi-party democracy in the southern United States uh, from about 1877 to around 1890. It was only after uh, the, populist move, the populist movement uh, started organizing in the southern part of the United States uh, and mobilizing African-American voters in the southern United States that you know, the Democratic Party in the South implemented Jim Crow restrictions, uh, reducing the access to the ballot for, for African Americans. So there was also, in that earlier polarization, there was an important authoritarian element uh, of one of the major parties, and they did you know, things to restrict the access uh, to the ballot in order to maintain power and continue winning elections. So uh, in that sense, the problems are actually quite similar. These are related questions. The first by Steve Sharma uh, of Hanover. With uh, po polarization as it stands now, why would the two existing major po political parties give power to a third party? How could that happen? And the second related question, can you please explain more detail how the fusion system would work? That's, that's the most important question. Uh, anytime people want to talk about reform is that if you want to reform the political system to change the behavior of political parties that currently have power, you have to get their buy-in in order, uh, in order to, do, to, to do that. And so uh, a lot of things, even if there were reforms that would reduce polarization, you know, solving that problem uh, is key. So one of the things that happens, though, in, at least in the states, is that states have initiative and referenda, and so changes can be made through the initiative and referenda. So California, as I mentioned in passing, California adopted a new electoral system called Top Two. All the candidates run on one ballot, and the top two candidates move to the general election, and then they have a general election. No party in California wanted that. It was through initiative and referenda. The parties fought it in court, and the court said, no, if the voters want that, that's what, that's what they get. So, so it can be done in some states through, through initiative and referenda, but of course not, 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 all, not all states. Um, so let me use fusion as a, explain fusion and then give fusion uh, as, a, as an example. So fusion is a process where a third party is created and they're not, they have the right to actually nominate, use their ballot line to nominate 
uh, a major party, a major party candidate. So there's a fusion party now. It's not called the fusion party. That is called the moderate party. But there's now a moderate party in New Jersey which wants to operate as a fusion party. So they're going to enter in one race, and what they would like to do is a race between Tom Keene Jr., uh, the former governor's son, and the incumbent member of Congress, Tom Malinowski. What the party would like to do is get on the ballot as the moderate party, but nominate Tom Malinowski uh, for their line. So Tom Malinowski's name will appear on the ballot twice. One is the candidate for the Democratic Party, and one is the candidate for the moderate party. And then moderate voters can vote for Tom on the moderate ballot. Democrats can vote for him on the Democratic. And then his vote totals are combined, and they'll take the combined vote totals and determine whether he gets more votes than Tom Kane. So that's how fusion works. Uh, fusion is currently, though, illegal in New Jersey. So, the, so the, the way they're approaching it is to push it forward and then try to get a favorable court decision that interprets the New Jersey Constitution is saying fusion has to be allowed under the freedom of, freedom of association. And if they can make that court case, you know, then the courts will you know, intervene and allow you know, the moderate party to have a ballot line and to use it uh, to fuse uh, with Tom Malinowski. So I think in a lot of cases, that's why I think fusion may be an attractive reform because it's one that can be pursued under the courts under a claim of uh, freedom of association should allow parties to nominate who, whom they want to, uh, and then the ballot should be counted you know, for, an, for an individual. Uh, so in principle, uh, it could be done uh, without the political parties allowing it. Uh, some courts have said it's not, fusion is not allowed due to freedom of association, but you know, courts can as we know now, know courts can change their mind. I don't know if they'll change their mind on this one, but but you know, a court route, a legal route, is one route. Uh, initiative and referenda is another route in the states for which that's allowed. Uh, Jim from the Granite State, Ollie asks, how can multi-member districts with rank choice support proportional representation? That's a great. Uh, that's a that's a great question too. Uh, so uh, let me unpack a little bit. So think about a multi-member, you know, district election. Um, so we have, uh, you know, say three candidates are going to be uh, elected in a district, and we're going to use rank choice. We're going to use rank choice. We're going to use rank choice voting uh, to elect those three candidates. Uh, so presumably, it'd be something like. A Republican voters will rank the Republican candidate first, a third party second, and the Democratic candidate third. And then, you know, a Democratic candidate would, you know, do the opposite. And if there's enough people doing that rank ordering, the top two candidates are going to be either a Democrat or Republican and the member of, and the member of the third party. And therefore, a third party can can win an election if they can be the second choice party for a large enough set of voters. And so, multi-member district elections and ranked choice voting can lead to you know successful third parties. I should say you don't need ranked choice voting for successful third parties in multi-member district elections. There are a lot of ways of conducting those elections that would give you the same that would give you the same same type of result. Steve Teffel, our OSHA president, asks, would the elimination of the filibuster affect polarization? It doesn't appear to have worked for the confirmation of Supreme Court justices. So the, the, eliminating the filibuster itself probably would not eliminate polarization. It would eliminate some of the gridlock associated with polarization. It would make it easier to pass laws in situations where one party has a bare has a bare majority and so it can do more things and so as we've seen there are some procedures in in the senate that don't require for which cannot be filibustered like budget reconciliation bills so we see lots of political policy action on using budget reconciliation because you don't see the filibuster so the gridlock can be reduced but i think it's unlikely to kind of reduce the uh, reduce the polarization. In fact, it may exacerbate it because it will be one of the 
last reasons for trying to build a bipartisan coalition is to get over the filibuster, and if you don't have the filibuster, you'll never, ever have to do that again. I think the filibuster should be reformed. I think the, the pro in terms of reducing gridlock probably outweigh the con of uh, uh, making bipartisanship in the Senate less necessary, but uh, uh, there, there probably is that trade-off. Do you think that the amount of time politicians spend fundraising while in D.C. and away from D.C. on weekends has eroded fraternization and increased uh, polarization? Less time socializing, getting to know each other may make it easier for politicians to demonize each other. Um, I, think there's an a I think there's an aspect of polarization that's related. Um, to those, to those interpersonal dynamics. I mean, I, as I, I'm a policy school professor, so I talk to lots of uh, elected officials and former elected officials, and they point to uh, the ways in which the lack of kind of interpersonal communication and interpersonal experiences, you know, affects the ways that they interact, that they interact with one another. Um, so I, I don't completely discount it. I think the causal arrow may sometimes move in the opposite direction, however, which is that because partisanship and polarization has gotten out of hand, uh, it's undermined, it's helped undermine those interpersonal relationships, and that's one of the big reasons that they don't exist. I, I don't think the kind of campaign finance system, which again, as mentioned in the question, involves inordinate amounts of time fundraising, um, helps. Uh, it's, it certainly, you know, means that, you know, members have less time for other things and building connections across the aisle is certainly, uh, is certainly one of those, uh, is certainly one of those things. Um, but, um, you know, it, it is true that the interpersonal relationships among legislators are really frayed at this point. Question on religion and politics. How does religious ideology affect polarization? Well, I mean, I think that the most uh, kind of direct impact uh, of religion on polarization is the fact that the, you know, the uh, Republican Party coalition, you know, the one that I talked about from the 1970s onward, uh, had evangelical Christians as a crucial component in that coalition. Uh, and so, you know, the, the party would you know, like any party has an important constituency or going to kind of cater, uh, cater to that constituency and, you know, uh, and pursue their interests. So the fact that a definable religious group was a core constituency of one of the parties clearly played a role in kind of developing, you know, uh, those divisions. Um, I think another aspect, not unrelated to the first, um, is that, you know, one of the anecdotes, antidotes to polarization is just compromise. I mean, nobody, I don't really question the validity of people having different view, different viewpoints coming to politics and policy matters, you know, with different perspectives and different goals. But at the end of the day, you would like them to, you know, compromise on, on those goals uh, in order to, you know, uh, solve problems. Um, the infusion of religion makes compromise a little bit more difficult because, you know, um, if you come to politics with a set, and it doesn't have to be religious, there, there are non-religious people who approach politics in the same way, but if you come to politics with a set of uh, inviolable moral convictions on which you won't compromise, then it's obviously going to not be a recipe for building consensus and solving, and solving problems. So I think there's, you know, direct effect of particular roles of religious actors in the system, but I also think it's kind of an overly moralized uh, approach to politics, uh, which has contributed to polarization. A uh, question on race. I was very surprised that you did not tell the whole story without really mentioning race at all. Is the polarization also possibly viewed as a story of the real rise of a multiracial society uh, met with a backlash of white revanchism? Um, 
Um, yes, uh, so that, that's a that's a good point. I covered a lot, but I left stuff out, and uh, you know that's obviously something that's uh, worth worth addressing. It, it is tr it is true, you know. So one of the correlations I've sort of documented and uh, in previous work is there's a very strong correlation going back to the 1880s and the uh, level of polarization in the percentage of American society which is uh, foreign-born. Uh, so immigration, immigration flows, stocks of new immigrants tend to lead to situations in which there are more political con conflict. And that's a pretty well-documented empirical, uh, em empirical regularity. It's also true, uh, I, I think consistent on this point, is the period in which I identified as the kind of a low period uh, of polarization in the U.S. also is a period of um, segregation and Jim Crow in the South and low participation of African Americans in the electorate, uh, and that you know many of the trends uh, that I identified start to uh, take off after the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act, increasing the participation of African Americans uh, in public and electoral life. Uh, so those. So those trends are there, and they're 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 very important. And there are people who've written on the importance of the, the backlash, both against immigration uh, and on on race. But if if you uh, if you look at the sort of policy component of you know the substance of what the parties have disagreed with, uh, it's clear that there's a racial component. But it's, it's clear that there are other parts of the policy debates. Which are you know sort of transcend you know racial divisions that you would expect to see uh, in, in 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 a single racial country. So I think you know race, the increasingly heterogeneous society due to both race and through immigration have really played an important role in kind of reducing the kind of social cohesion uh, in the U.S. Presumably, have also led to you know backlashes. Uh, in particular quarters, uh, but I, I think that there are other sources of those conflicts, uh, which you know are not entirely explained by by race and backlash. Um, polarization, in some circumstances, is harmful, but in others, can it be an expression of difference? Uh, it, but in others, it enables a, an expression of difference. Um, yeah, that's also uh, important to acknowledge. So I, I kind of think of there being a kind of a Goldilocks issue with polarization, that um, you know there can be too little, uh, and there can be too much, and maybe there's somewhere in the middle there's a just right. So it's just an interesting story. In the 1950s, uh, the political science community was actually concerned with the lack of polarization, the lack of differentiation of the parties. The fact that both parties, as I showed in the graph, both parties were kind of middle of the road. Uh, and there were lots of voices, uh, both in the left and the right, which were not part of, you know, Congress or the legislative debate or the debates about public policy issues. Most notably, as I mentioned, African Americans were not uh, central to that debate because they were excluded elect electorally. So in the 1950s, you know, people like me were writing about how can we make the party system more polarized, more pro programmatic, get the parties to differentiate themselves and stand for something. And they were right in the context of the 1950s. Uh, my argument really is that at some point between then and now, we went through the Goldilocks point, uh, reached a point where the